music's turned off, so I guess it's time to start. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming down to my session today about being cheap with the cloud. For those of you that I haven't met before, hello, welcome. My name's Aaron Powell. I work for Microsoft as a developer advocate, a part of the Cloud Advocates team, as a number of us that you'll see around the event today, as well as a number of other Microsoft people. Uh, but I've been working in, in the web space for about 15 years now, uh, building applications of a variety of different size, scale, and a bunch of different requirements. And throughout doing that, I, I've learned a few things about how, to, uh, how I think we should design applications and how that can relate to the way that we spend our money to run those applications. You'll find me online at various uh, social locations. Um, I, I tweet, apologies if you do follow me on Twitter, it's probably not particularly interesting. Uh, hopefully I blog a little bit more of interesting stuff, um, but that's also where you can contact me afterwards if you wanna know more or have any questions and stuff like that. I'll also be around for the rest of the event uh, if you do wanna track me down and ask me about anything else. But when I started building this talk and the notion of doing something about how to be a bit of a cheapskate when it comes to using cloud computing, is that I realized that cheap is really a relative term. If you're a small business or a freelancer, cheap to you might mean it costs you only a couple of dollars a month. Whereas if you're a, a national organization or a large enterprise, cheap might mean a few thousand dollars a month. So the stuff that I'm gonna talk about today in this, uh, in this talk, Bear in mind of what that means in context of the kinds of applications that you build and the kinds of problems that you're trying to solve. I can't solve, uh, I can't answer every single question that you might have and how to build every single style of application because every project is different and every set of requirements are different. So this is just gonna be a bunch of things that I've learned in, uh, uh, throughout my career that I think would be valuable in the way that we can think about applications. Uh, I started about 15 years ago working for a web agency down in Melbourne. Uh, we were a large agency. We had offices in Melbourne, Brisbane, and Sydney. And one of the things that, that afforded us was the ability to have our own data center on site. Uh, that was not overly common in, um, at least not with the other companies that I knew at the time. Uh, but we would have racks and racks of servers that looked a lot messier than this because we have a lot more cables, but otherwise fairly similar. Uh, but the way that we would build applications is we'd have these Linux and Windows machines. We would build something in .NET or in Java or PHP. We would then uh, deploy them onto the bare metal and we would work out which server had the greatest capacity available for the sort of application we needed to build and we'd put it onto that. Uh, over time, we started to move away from just having uh, things on physical infrastructure to start virtualizing that infrastructure so that we could maybe move some of the, uh, the resources around as needed but still it was infrastructure that we owned, that we managed, and that was, you know, it was ours. And there was a lot of uh, value in doing it that way, but we also had a lot of drawbacks. It was around about the start of this decade, the commoditization of cloud really became uh, a thing. Uh, we, we were no longer being told there was this cloud thing coming and that it wasn't just you know, what you would see in the weather, but it was actually a way that we were going to be able to build our applications for the future. I started uh, moving into a consulting role at another company at this point and working with IT leaders and uh, management in those organizations that were interested in the cloud, they were wanting to know what they meant, uh, what it could mean for their business. And there was things that were being thrown around as the, the buzzwords to describe cloud. You know, th this was gonna be infinite scale. We were going to be able to uh, rethink the way that we we're building applications. We were gonna be able to deploy faster. All that sort of stuff that was gonna make the cloud a very appealing option to someone that was running an application. Uh, but the problem was that we knew one way to build applications and that was designed around the way that we'd always built applications. And what it resulted in was us treating the cloud as just someone else's computer. It was no longer infrastructure that we were managing, it was infrastructure that someone else was managing. If we needed more compute power, we'd just move a slider or we'd run a script against our cloud provider and we would have more virtual machine provision for us. And, but that wasn't really changing the fundamental way that we were building applications because we just treated it like someone else's machine. And the drawback was that we didn't really change anything. The only thing that was really radically different from the way that we were working with our infrastructure pri previously and the way that we had our applications working previously was that we no longer needed to go to a procurement team to then purchase another blade server to drop into a rack somewhere, or we'd no longer needed to contact our hosting provider and hope that they still had capacity for us to deploy additional resources in their infrastructure. So 
nothing changed for a lot of the kinds of companies I was working with and the, uh, the sorts of applications that they were built in, building. And that's because they weren't really thinking about how to design an application that was going to be designed to work effectively within the cloud. So this meant that I started to have to change the way I would have conversations with the people that were making the decisions about the applications they were going to be building. Whether it was a rewrite of, a new of an existing application, it was a new project they were undertaking within the organization, we'd start thinking about what do they need to do? What kind of interface did you need to have for the users that were going to work with your application? Is it a web application or a mobile application? A thick client or a thin client running on a desktop? Is it a dashboard that's getting driven from data systems that are somewhere in, within inside of other parts of your organization? What did that mean for the kinds of infrastructure that were most applicable for that sort of a problem to be solved? Not just applicable because we know how to build an application. And then what kind of backend were you going to use for that? And not just the core technology, whether it was a .NET application, Java, Python, Ruby, et cetera, but how is that going to work? What other resources did that application need to consume? And how is that backend going to work with those resources available with inside of the rest of your infrastructure? Do you need to store data, or do you need to retrieve data from some kind of a downstream system? If so, what did that look like? How were you going to structure the data that was stored? What decisions would that mean around the kinds of infrastructure you would use for data storage? I worked on a number of applications uh, throughout my career which we would deploy with a SQL server, and that SQL server was really just holding like five tables in a dozen rows. But we, that was the way that we built applications, because that was the way that we knew to, do, uh, to build an application. And finally, are the applications you're building, do they need to operate with every response happening in real time? Or were there other ways that we could do the processing that needs to be done and still get the, uh, an optimal user experience to the customers that they were servicing? I want to touch on how we can address some of these questions throughout the rest of this talk. But the other thing that's important to think about when we are looking at how we can be more cost effective in the kinds of applications that we build in the cloud is that cost isn't just the tech that we're using. Because every decision we make can also have a people cost. If we, we can build an application that is using as minimal cloud resources as possible and it's costing us next to nothing to run, but what is the maintenance cost for us as a development team to look after that and build and uh, extend? What is the operational cost that we've got for that? Just because we've made something cheap doesn't mean that we haven't moved that cost to a different part of our organization. It might have started out as you know, a line item in a bill that comes in once a month, but we completely forgot about the fact that we have to pay 10 staff to manage all of that at the end of the day. I really started properly looking into this a couple of years ago with a conference that I'm on the organizing team for called DDD Sydney. Uh, we're a not-for-profit conference, we run on the weekend, and we keep everything as low as we can, uh, low cost as we can because we want to stick to that not-for-profit not mantra. But in doing so, we needed to think about how we were spending our money effectively. We built a web platform for this, uh, it showed the, uh, the website for the conference, uh, the agenda, we would have people submit CFPs and all that sort of stuff, but we built it in a way that we knew how to build applications. We would have a web application, it was written in ASP.NET MVC at the time, uh, it would run in an Azure App Service, it would connect to a database, and when it came for the next year, we would clone that infrastructure. And then the year after that, we would clone that infrastructure again because we like to have the previous years by, uh, visible still so that people could go back and look at what was the conference last year and uh, see whether it was an event that they wanted to, uh, wanted to attend this year. But this was costing around about $60 uh, per month uh, after the first couple of years, and it was coming off my personal credit card, so every month I'd have to do an expense claim back to the business to make sure that it wasn't costing me personally a lot of money, but then filling out expense claims reports is tedious, and I would just tend not to do that, and I was uh, absor absorbing the cost, but then we were, it's starting to creep up, and I'm starting to get questions from my wife of, why are we paying for this? Why aren't you getting that money back? The company should be paying you for it. So I thought, well, there's got to be a better way to do this. I've just done what I've always done, because that was the way that I knew to build an application. It was the easiest way for me to build an application. But it was starting to hurt. So I wanted to think about how we would do that differently, and that's where a lot of the ideas that started this talk came from, and the the ideas that I use going into conversations with uh, IT leaders in organizations came from. But I'm a web developer at heart, so let's start by thinking about what kind of web platforms do we need and what can we do with those things to optimize the spend that we have. 
The first question that I, I want you to ask yourselves when building a web application is, what's going to make that application tick? What works for the end users? Is this an application that is very server heavy? Or is it something that has a lot of stuff that happens in the client? And that can change fundamentally the kinds of architecture that you have, because if it's very heavy in the client, well, maybe you don't need a full web server behind that. Do you need to be running IS on a Windows server or Apache or Nginx or anything like that in front of you know, something pretty simple? Are you just spending a lot of time on the server converting strings into HTML strings to send back to the browser? Is that the most efficient use of server resources in your application? Can you build this application as a single page application or maybe even take it a next step and have it as a complete static site, just rendered HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that you can host somewhere instead. That can fundamentally change the sorts of compute resources that you would use inside of a cloud environment. Single page application frameworks like Hugo, or uh, sorry, like, like React, or um, Vue.js, Angular, and stuff like that can make it really easy to build a rich client experience where it doesn't have a huge server behind it. Server might start uh, being used for other things inside of your application. Static sites, we can go down the route of Gatsby.js, Hugo, Viewpress, etc., where we can now generate, using front-end technologies, just HTML files, CSS, and JavaScript. So if we can go down the route of a static website, and this is the one that we can generate probably the, the best cost savings for, because well, we don't necessarily need a full web server, it allows us to just pre-generate our CSS, HTML, and JavaScript, and put that on somewhere that we can serve out. You know, whether that's a, um, a server uh, like, um, sorry, excuse me. Whether it's a server like um, Netlify or Heroku or something really low cost, we can use that as our, as our hosting option. But when we start going down this route of building a really static website, we have to ask other questions to ourselves. And this is where I say that every cost saving option that you look at might have a separate trade-off. What does the deployment look like for a static website? You know, do we have, like, how do we have multiple versions? How are we doing A-B testing? How are we doing a, a pre-prod and prod and a test environment and things like that? Because supporting multiple environments from a static website might be quite difficult. How do you embed an API key into just a HTML file uh, that you need to change that API key on every environment? That's one of the uh, really powerful things that you can do from a server that is just doing essentially spring building. So then it comes down to how do we host our static websites? Um, uh, uh, places like Netlify, um, uh, uh, Zephy, I think it is, um, S3 buckets on AWS. Uh, there's a lot of different options out there, uh, but the one that I've had the most experience with and I found uh, reasonably easy to use is through uh, the Azure Static Sites. So Azure Static Sites is an extension on blob storage. We've been able to host static websites with inside of Azure Blobs for quite a long time. Uh, but the problem was that it was never designed to be used that way. Uh, we were just exploiting the fact that an Azure Blob Store was able to send out a, uh, a URL and you could access that anonymously, uh, and now we're able to get uh, the contents of that and serve with the correct mime type. But if we were wanting to do something like routing to that, or if we wanted to do a 404 page, pretty URLs that didn't have like index.html on them, there was no efficient way to do that with blob storage, and that's what Static Sites gives us with inside of Azure. All it does behind the scenes is, is add a special container to a storage account called Dollars Web. So this can be in an existing storage account. It doesn't have to be an entirely new storage account created specifically for our static website. I would recommend to do that that way. Um, so you separate the uh, your essentially your infrastructure from maybe any other storage that you've got. Uh, but that's uh, that's fairly simple to do um, and quite cost effective with inside of Azure. But with most static so, uh, static hosting sites, we want to um, we want to think about well, is just storing it straight uh, like serving it straight from storage, serving it straight from the file system essentially. Is that the best option that we've got? Because most static service uh, ser hosting services charge not just for the disk storage of the assets, but also for the access to those. So the, the data in and data out of the request. So you're paying for that as well as paying for storage. So this is where a CDN might also be valuable to add to your application. 
particularly if we're building a single page application. A single page application, we probably want to do some routing because the single page application might only have a single HTML file that exists, you know, like an index.html that sits at the root, but you could go to slash agenda, slash speakers, slash about, and it all needs to redirect back to that same page. So how do we do that? A CDN can give us that uh, ability as well. A CDN can also generally uh, give us a SSL certificate over our uh, static website. Um, by and large, these are free. Pretty much every um, CDN that I would go to use has a free SSL provided, um, generally by someone like Let's Encrypt. And uh, what that means is that you know, we get that secure layer uh, on top of our website and we don't have to uh, add an additional cost. We don't have an additional management layer taken care of by our CDN. Also, it means that by putting this, uh, we can start caching our data at the edge rather than having to rely on everything that happens on our storage account. There's a bunch of different CDNs uh, that are out there that, are, uh, that you can use. You've got Akamai, Cloudflare. Cloudflare has a really great free tier level. Um, you, uh, from the free tier, uh, you can um, you only start paying if you want to use uh, the workers, uh, so the Cloudflare workers component of it, uh, before you want to scale up to maybe the next tier within inside of the CDN. Uh, inside of Azure, we've got Azure CDN. Uh, there's a couple of options with Azure CDN, uh, Microsoft provided or provided by uh, some third parties, but just rebranded and white labeled by Microsoft. And then we've got Azure Front Door, uh, which is uh, kind of a, a globally distributed content network, but not quite the same as a CDN. Um, it's designed for uh, slightly more performant things than just maybe a static website. And also it's a bit more expensive because of uh, the way that that works. Um, Azure Front Door actually uses the, uh, the Microsoft uh, global, backbone, uh, global network backbone to uh, move files around rather than um, putting them straight over the public internet. So uh, it costs a bit more. It's around about $40 a month Australian to run uh, HTTPS only and uh, pretty URL. So it might not be the right choice for an ultra low cost solution if you're like a small business or a uh, freelancer, but there's other organizations where $40 a month is, is pretty much nothing. Um, Azure CDN uh, has that advantage of it's built into the, the portal, so you, you, uh, you management of that, you, uh, your accounts, they're not some other set of accounts, whereas if you're using like an Akamai or a Cloudflare, you have this other set of accounts that you've got to manage in conjunction with you know, where the rest of your infrastructure is. So if someone leaves your organization, you've got to make sure you're doing password rotation to, so that they no longer have access to stuff in production, not just disconnecting them from you know, Azure AD or you know, whatever your identity management platform is for uh, your organization. So combining all of those together, what does it look like cost-wise? It looks like pretty transitions between slides. That's what it looks like. So to host a static website with inside of Azure, uh, this is about a gig of storage within Blob Store, which is the smallest um, storage unit you could have in um, Blob Store. That's 17 cents. Uh, that's 10,000 writes a month. Um, it's 100,000 reads and 100 gigabytes, uh, sorry, 1,000 gigabytes of data transfer um, in and out. So you do pay for that data transfer. Um, you, can, you can make it even cheaper if you reduce the amount that you're, uh, that you're expecting to transfer in and out and put a CDN in front of it and cache the, um, the static assets because at the end of the day, they're not changing all that frequently. You can cache them in your CDN until you need to uh, update and, and then um, you can update your CDN and tell it to purge its cache. Uh, Azure CDN, it's about a, a buck 60 a month to, uh, to run that with uh, a gig of um, uh, outbound data across all the regions globally. Uh, this is how I run my personal blog. It costs me less than two bucks a month to run. Um, I can personally absorb that cost. I don't need to you know, worry about, do I need to put ads on my blog or something like that to recoup you know, less than a cup of coffee in Sydney and less than a, like a really terrible cup of coffee in Sydney. Yeah. I don't know anywhere in Sydney where you would get a decent coffee for that price. Um, but obviously, you know, this is the kind of stuff that you, you start looking at going, oh, well, maybe I, I can really change the way my costs are, are structured because I can use some different services here and some, maybe some optimized services for what we actually need. Now, I can still host a static website inside of an app service in Azure, but it's going to cost me a lot more money. But let's be realistic, you're going to probably need a server at some point. It'd be nice to think that we never actually had to touch any sort of downstream system. You know, there was no database behind any web application. And then the web is all of a sudden doing exactly what it was originally designed to do. It's just a document sharing platform. Uh, but you know, that was you know, the, the early 90s. We're a little bit more advanced today. 
So what does it look like when we're thinking about you know, optimized costs for a server? Well, the first bit of advice I can give you is you probably don't need Kubernetes. Uh, it might seem like a good buzzword to, you, to throw in. We need some Kubernetes on that, you know, clusters and stuff like that. But you probably don't need it. A lot of applications are deployed into Kubernetes that it's probably not giving them the value that they expect to get from it because Kubernetes does have quite a expensive cost associated with it across whichever platform that you're looking at hosting it on. It's not overly cheap. So you want to make sure that you understand the reason that you're paying for that cost. I said, if you are just going cheap for the sake of cheap, you're moving your cost somewhere else. So Kubernetes might give you some valuable cost. Um, but there is a good quote about uh, Kubernetes that uh, I saw from Corey Quinn or Quinny Pig on Twitter. It's that Kubernetes is the Greek god of spending money in the cloud. It's just some uh, friendly advice from your neighborhood CDA. So instead, I'm going to talk about the other buzzword that we have at the moment, and it is 2019. I would be remiss about giving a talk on the internet uh, about the internet that doesn't involve serverless. So if you're waiting for serverless to be uh, mentioned in today's talk, you can now leave. But that is, like, it's, it's 2019, we have to build with serverless. Uh, and whoever came up with the name serverless as like the marketing name for this was fantastic because th there are still servers. Like, well, why is it serverless? We haven't solved that problem yet. Uh, but really it's about thinking less about the infrastructure that we've got and more about the compute that you need to do. How do you, uh, you don't have to worry about how you can scale, uh, just that it will scale. Uh, so it is, um, it is valuable in that regards, and you know, while I like to make fun of the fact that the name doesn't make any sense, um, it is a very useful pattern to be using in an application. But when I talk about serverless, I don't mean that you're building microservices. Um, serverless doesn't mean that you have to do a microservices architecture. You can do microservices that leverage serverless, but it's not the only way that you can use serverless. You can use serverless in conjunction with you know, any sort of other application you might be building. You can build a monolith in serverless if you really wanted to. I've done that. It's not ideal, but you can still do it. But what serverless does mean to an application and to the way that you think about an application is a very different sort of design. Because when we look at a, you know, a traditional application design, you know, we would have you know, some kind of a web server that's probably serving out a REST API, maybe serving out SOAP because you know, you, you, you're still working with XML-based um, data contracts, or maybe you're doing a REST API, or GraphQL, or whatever the, the uh, data transfer mode that you've used, uh, and it is gonna be right for the kind of applications you're building. You know, you've still got a server that is responsible for probably multiple endpoints that you're gonna connect into. And these endpoints tend to be very request response driven, and that request response is very tightly coupled. The user clicks a button and it goes to the server. The server receives that HTTP request that comes in, unpacks some data from it. It then goes to your business la layer. That business layer then goes to the data layer. The data layer then goes to the database because it's end tier all the way down. And that's a common way to build an application. It's, there's nothing wrong with building that. I'm not saying that there's something wrong with that. But this is the way a lot of applications are designed. And it works very well for a lot of scenarios. But because it's all a single operation, it can be difficult to think about how we scale it or how we can uh, treat it differently from a, uh, a management and infrastructure standpoint. Because the scalability of a standard web application, uh, serving at whatever sort of endpoints that we need, that can scale both up and out. Up, I mean, you know, you, you're bottlenecked by the fact that the requests take a lot more CPU or memory uh, power to do the processing, so you need beefier machines to process that. Or maybe you need to go out because you're serving more, uh, you need to serve more requests than your infrastructure currently handles. You've got that really good flexibility when working with a, uh, a traditional application stack. Serverless, on the other hand, is a very event-centric, loosely coupled, um, eventually consistent programmatic model. What I mean by eventual consistency is that you, you might be doing something in your application, but the result of that doesn't get back to the user immediately. Let's take an e-commerce checkout process. The user has clicked um, uh, process order uh, to, in the, the shopping cart, they've provided their credit card details, all that sort of stuff. In the back end, uh, I, I, you've done a, like a, a REST call, you've provided that data across, and it's gonna go through a sequential workflow of 
uh, write to the database that the order has been placed, update you know, SAP or some other backend system to indicate that an order needs to be processed from your warehouse or whatever it might be. Uh, it needs to then go to the payment provider and issue that payment and actually take the, uh, the money off the credit card. It then sends an email of the receipt to the user, but does the user need to wait for every single one of those operations to complete before they see an update on their UI? Probably not. Like, are they expecting an email to be sent to them seconds after they've clicked that button? Or can we do an eventual consistency model where the user clicks the button, we immediately go back saying, acknowledging that they have submitted the, the payment request, and then we use events to trigger off a whole bunch of other little workflows in the background. In five, 10, however many minutes time, they might receive an email saying that their uh, order has been successfully processed, uh, and here's their receipt number and all that kind of stuff. So that they're not sitting there waiting and waiting going, do, do I click it again? And again, and again, again, right? or you have to build something in your UI to make sure that the user can't click that button multiple times. But with serverless, we can't do scale up. For most serverless uh, options that I've looked at in the market, scaling is always going to be scaling out. You throw more compute at it, not bigger compute, which means that you have to think about designing your uh, components to be small and efficient, because you're generally going to be charged by how long they take to run. But you can throw, uh, but the, uh, the underlying host will throw as much, uh, as many inf uh, bits of infrastructure at it as required to service the number of requests that are there. And you, know, you just receive a bill at the end of the month that tells you how many requests were, were processed. Uh, there's a bunch of different serverless options. Uh, every cloud provider has their own one, it's, uh, whether it's Lambdas in AWS, uh, Google Cloud Functions in GCP, or Azure Functions with inside of Azure. Uh, Azure Functions is the code first approach to doing serverless on Azure. Uh, it's one of three options for doing serverless with inside of Azure. Uh, does anyone want to take a guess at what the other two options might be? Because uh, most people are actually aware that we have multiple serverless options. You are correct. Logic Apps is, um, is one of the other serverless options inside of Azure. And the, the third one is uh, the Azure Container Instances. So Logic Apps is a designer-driven, a, 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 a drag and drop to build out a uh, a, a serverless process with inside of the Azure portal. Um, you can do it in code, it is uh, a JSON uh, at, at the end of the day, so you can source control it and all that sort of stuff, um, but it's easier to, to kind of build it up through the UI using drag and drop. Um, Logic apps are really good for integrating with a variety of different uh, services beyond what you can do from Azure Functions. Um, Azure Container Instances, on the other hand, is containers as serverless. So it's designed more around batch processing, so if you've got something that you need to um, a, a process like through data crunching or, or something like that, uh, you can do that in uh, an, a Docker container and you don't have to worry about managing the, the infrastructure that, that spins up their container or spins up multiple of those containers. So you don't need to think about Kubernetes or um, any of those orchestrators as well. But I like Azure Functions because I'm a coder at heart and I like to, I prefer to write code. It doesn't have quite as many integrations as you'll get out of, uh, out of Logic Apps though. So you can subscribe to a whole bunch of different events that might happen in, uh, in your uh, environment. Those events could be a web request coming in, a HTTP endpoint that can be uh, served out uh, for an Azure function, or it could be an event coming through from some other system, like an event hub, a queue, uh, Cosmos DB, or a myriad of other things that are available with inside of Azure that disconnect, or sorry, decouple your application from what's actually happening around it. With Azure Functions, we can also build workflows. So it's not just designed around a request comes in or an event is triggered, it does something, and then you know, it, it passes something to someone else and you never actually see the end result of that. Um, we can chain these together using durable functions in Azure, and we can observe the completion of that complex workflow. Um, and that can be fed back into our, uh, if we're doing eventual consistency, we can feed that back up and keep pulling saying, is this workflow completed? Is this workflow completed? so on and so forth, until it is done, and then notify you know, an end user. Functions has a pretty good price point um, for a lot of use case scenarios. Uh, I think the first million executions of functions are free uh, in a consumption model, and then after that you pay, versus, uh, pay of the time it takes to execute the function, uh, the memory used for that function, and the number of functions that are executed. Uh, but a million functions is, uh, a million executions is uh, it's like a decent starting point. Um, after that, if you start paying money, Troy Hunt has a really excellent blog post about how he has slashed his Azure Functions bills by using Cloudflare Workers to cache the results of functions. Uh, in, the, uh, in the session notes that I'll uh, share at the end, uh, I link to that blog post 
but he is dealing with uh, 140 million requests a month or something like that, I think it was for porn passwords. And I think that was costing him around two or $300 Australian to serve. Uh, by uh, doing caching using Cloudflare workers, he was able to, to cut that cost down to dollars um, and reduce uh, and shift a lot of that cost into Cloudflare. And then because it was cached and not actually hitting um, downstream systems, it was still cheaper running it through Cloudflare in that manner. But like I said, there's a, he's got a great write up about that. Um, or if you, you catch him at the conference uh, this week, you can ask him about it. And I'm sure he's more than happy to, to talk through some of the details. And like I said, I'll share that uh, content, uh, sorry, share that link at the end. Data storage. We're probably going to need to store data uh, for our application. You know, that's something that the backend might need to, to talk to. So we're going to need to think about how we will do that and what that means in the way that we are designing our application from a cost standpoint. Uh, but ultimately, data management is probably the hardest thing to optimize cost for in a generic set of recommendations because the way that you store your data, the kind of data that you're capturing in your application, and then the kind of access you need to that data is going to dictate the styles of storage, the way that you, um, uh, the way that you work with it, and the, the costs that are then associated with it. Um, are you building an application that will be designed best using structured or unstructured data? A SQL Server versus a NoSQL database like MongoDB, which of those is going to be better? They're going to have very different price points to them. Is your application a very write-heavy system, or is it a read-heavy system? Okay. These things change again, the way that we want to store data, and by the way that we store data, change the way that we cost against it. We've got so many different options that we can think about to do that. So how do we pick what's going to be the right one for us? Now, ultimately, I can't give you that answer without going around to each and every one of you in the room today and ask what kind of applications are you building, what do you need, uh, and giving you recommendations that are designed around the sorts of problems that you're building. So instead, I want to talk about a couple of generic tips that can help you think through the problems that you're trying to solve and the way that you can uh, design a system for solving those problems. So with that in mind, one thing that took me a long time to wrap my head around is that there's nothing wrong with storing data in multiple locations and storing the same data multiple times. When I first started in IT, uh, the, the architects, the lead developers, and senior developers would be saying, you, know, you store the data in one table in SQL Server or whatever data store we were using, and you don't duplicate that. You go back to that table whenever you need to retrieve that data. But that would mean that you know, if I was showing a shopping cart and I wanted to show on every single page, it's just the count of how many uh, items were in the cart, I'd always have to go and select um, a count against that table with you know, a query. And then you, know, you might have joins and other things like that. You know? And this is expensive. Why am I do doing that when I could just store a value in another table that's current cart count is three? Be one of the reasons you can't do that, or one of the reasons that makes that difficult, is eventual consistency. Now, you need to be able to update multiple places concurrently. Uh, and if the user is clicking a button to add to cart and expecting their cart count to update very quickly after that, or like, immediately, if it's an eventually consistent system, you've got to think about how you do that. Is the data that you're storing in your system always needing to be accessed? Or if you're storing data you know, over multiple years, do you need to access data from 10 years ago at the same level of performance as the data that you stored 10 minutes ago? Maybe, maybe not. So look at, uh, look at the options of using hot and cold storage. If you've got data that is only periodically accessed, Maybe you do it like a monthly report so you can track trends over time in your system. Well, push some of that data into cold storage because it's going to generally be cheaper than keeping it in hot storage. And you don't need to access it at the same performance level that you need to access other data. And think about how you can leverage eventing to move data around your system. It doesn't need to happen on every single request that you're processing data. Maybe you have some event system that is getting out the data and building out um, uh, data views that you can work with instead. So I like to go down the route of recommending that people look at mul uh, multi-mode storage, so using a couple of different ways of storing data. I have an IoT project that I built earlier this year, and when I started building it, uh, I just was pulling data out of my Raspberry Pi, and I was throwing it straight into a SQL Server. And I, it, it worked. That's how I knew to build applications. But then I was talking to some of the people on, on my team that do IoT, and they said, well, but that's 
really quite inefficient, you'd be better off streaming data in, because you're doing a write-heavy application. So why don't you put that data into something that is write-optimized? So instead, I shifted it so that the data was getting pushed into an event hub. I just stream data up. Right? My, my client just pumps data up every 20 seconds, and then I have uh, some serverless components that sit there and monitor that data stream that's incoming, break the data down, and ultimately store it into a read-optimized location so I can build reporting on it. Again, this is for an eventually consistent application because I, I, my dashboards, I don't need to see the data coming out of my Pi fully real time. I can, I can deal with like a two minute delay or a five minute delay that it might take to process all the data. But I'm able to, like my, my Pi is able to do things in milliseconds because it's just throwing something in an event hub. It's not actually waiting for a response to come back from the server saying, thanks, here's the SQL server ID of that road that we've just written. The other thing is, like, if you are being able to build read models and you're modeling the data that you need to um, access with inside of your system, think how you can cache that. Whether you go down the route that Troy was able to do with porn passwords and push it into a CDN and actually cache the response of an API call at an edge node, or are you able to put it into a, a fast read um, store system like a Redis cache so that you uh, have the data that you constantly need to read and process and would have been a traditional like select star and uh, maybe a join across a couple of tables, push a view of that as close as you can to where it is read uh, and pull it back out. So when it comes to thinking about how you can save costs with uh, a storage model in the cloud, always look at hosted options. Uh, hosted SQL servers, um, no SQL databases like MongoDB or CacheDB or anything like that. A hosted option gives you a myriad of things that you can do yourself. Like you can spin up a VM, install SQL Server on it, or install Mongo on it, but then who's managing the patches with that? Who's making sure that you update the, the product that's running your database? Who's doing backup management, threat mitigation? All of those things you have to handle yourself. Or can you offload that to someone? Their, their job is to do this across fleets of machines. Uh, and, and, and like infrastructure at scale beyond what you as an organization are capable of doing. If you're able to work, or if you're working on projects where data sovereignty isn't a concern, shop around the regions of your cloud provider. Maybe there's cheaper options outside of Australia. Using Azure as, as an example, to store, a, uh, to run a SQL server in Azure is more expensive to run a SQL server, uh, sorry, in Azure Australia is more expensive than it is to run that in the US regions. It's economies of scale. The data centers in Australia are smaller and fewer than the data centers in the US. They have more power, they have more compute available, so they want people to use that. There's no point charging the same price everywhere if you know, the, the, the compute availability is more, um, is more in a particular region. Obviously, this is only available if, you're, um, if data sovereignty isn't a concern or latency isn't a concern. Uh, if you're constantly pulling out of, uh, of hot storage, but there's a, you know, a two second hop that you've got to do to actually get that data back, or you've, you've shifted your cost problem elsewhere. Uh, inside of Azure, uh, SQL Server in Azure is, it's around about $1,000 a month. You need to run of like a reasonable size. Um, but if you look at the reserved instances, and most cloud providers have this for any sort of large compute options, so whether it's um, SQL servers or infrastructure as a service, reserved instances are basically, I'm going to, I'm going to need this resource for one year, three year, whatever it might be. Cool, we'll give you a discount on that. I think in Azure you get about 30% discount if you do a three year um, uh, purchasing of uh, SQL Server um, compute power. Uh, yeah. That's a, it's something to consider. If this application is intended to live for a while, don't just pay month on month bills, like commit to, to long term. Uh, if you're using something like Cosmos DB, like we, a lot of people like to pick on Cosmos DB because it can be a very expensive option for storing data. As a, as a mixed paradigm database, it can do NoSQL or SQL or um, graph databases and stuff like that. And it can be quite expensive. But a lot of the reasons people see it as expensive is they don't properly think through what kind of resource uh, units they, they uh, sorry, request units that they actually need with inside of uh, the, the infrastructure. So if you don't need to have you know, a high scale continuously, work out how you can do dynamic scale Pay for as little as you need for the common scenarios and then scale up at the points in time that you do need it. 
So unfortunately, I can't give you an answer on how much it's gonna cost to store data in the cloud for your applications because everyone's application is gonna be a little bit different. But going with, um, using SQL Server, because it's just the easiest one to, um, to price up. A, a reasonable size SQL Server uh, uh, from a storage and uh, from a, a compute power standpoint will cost you around about a sh uh, thousand Australian dollars a month. And that comes with backups, threat mitigation, um, monitoring, all that kind of stuff. You can run it yourself, and you can probably run it for cheaper as infrastructure, but what is the other cost that you've then got to have on it? What's the cost of maintaining that infrastructure? We're building applications, so we're probably gonna need to do something to get that application in production. We're probably working in a team as well, so we need to think about where do we store our source code? Uh, we're not going to be sharing that around on floppy disks or, wow, floppy disks, I just showed my age, didn't I? Ouch. <laughs> Why did my brain go floppy disks, other, like, first over USB? I like, should have gone zip drive. Uh, but we're going to probably store it in some hosting environment, and it's going to be Git. Uh, it's, it's one the the source control wars of the day. Uh, that, you know, that could be GitHub, it could be GitHub Enterprise, it could be GitLab, it could be uh, Bitbucket, it could be Azure repos, it could be you know, a myriad of other things. But the questions that we start asking ourselves around the way that we host source control is more, well, what does that mean for integration to the rest of our systems? And for the day-to-day -day life of a developer that's working with this? Are we doing pull requests for uh, code changes that are coming into our application? Do we have to have gates on particular branches? Do we have checks that have to be uh, met before we can merge to master and cut a release? What systems do we have available that give us that? And are they, uh, how are they gonna integrate with the workflow the developers want to use, not the workflow that we're telling the developers they have to use? And then when it comes to build and deploy, there's plenty of options out there. We've got things like GitHub Actions. GitHub Actions is, it's currently in preview at the moment, so it might not be a viable option for many people. A risk adverse option, um, so it's a high risk option because it's not a, a like a, um, a, a public you know, released product, it's, it's still in beta. But it has some great integration with GitHub. It's really simple to use. The workflow is fantastic in the way that you can build it up and connect a whole bunch of small steps along the way to get an output and to deploy an application into an environment. Maybe something a bit more complex like Azure Pipelines is a better option. Uh, this gives us a lot more complex integrations. We have a lot of gates and checks that we can put in place. But is that an overhead that our developers are not going to need? Uh, does the, the cost to use this system mean that you know, while we might not pay a lot for it, but the day-to-day -day cost of it is higher? I like Pipelines because it has a very clear separation between the build and deploy. It integrates nicely into, um, into Azure to deploy an application. It can integrate with pretty much every source control provider from whether it's uh, GitHub or GitLab, Bitbucket, et cetera. You, know, you just provide your source code from wherever is the right place to provide it. Maybe you wanna not pay for the actual licensing of the build product and go with open, something open source like Jenkins. But then you have uh, that shifted cost of, well, what is the cost for the resources that have to manage that, uh, have to host that, and then the people that have to manage that infrastructure for your build agents. And then how does that integrate with the way that you're going to be doing a task board, or like tracking the work that needs to be completed for your application? I've seen teams work very successfully out of just a trolley board. You don't need to have you know, this big complex backlog management tool if it's a simple project and you, you have a small team. I've seen teams that work very effectively with just post-it notes stuck on a wall, but you lose some level of reporting on that. It's difficult to work out what's been completed at the end of a sprint or after a couple of sprints if you've just got to go through a stack of post-it notes that have been stuck onto the, the wall at the end of the task board. How does the, the source control and how does the build system integrate with your backlog management tool? You might really like a product like Jira as a, a backlog management tool because it works very well for your uh, organization, but you're using GitHub for source control how are you linking those two together so that when a developer commits some changes, they're able to tag a, uh, the appropriate issue and you can do that traceability of change through your, uh, your business. Again, these are all questions that you have to think through when picking particular products to service the needs that you have as an organization. The easiest one for me to price on this uh, was Azure DevOps, um, which uh, covers across both uh, all the products like repos, boards, um, uh, uh, 
uh, pipelines and a bunch of other stuff that you may or may not need as an organization. Um, it's, uh, the first five users of uh, Azure Pipelines is free, and then after that, it's uh, $6 a month uh, per user. Uh, you're able to then scale out your team to whatever size you need. You get 30 um, hours of build infrastructure per month. You can choose to pay more to get more build infrastructure. You can add your own build agents um, uh, if you want to manage infrastructure yourself. But that's a, uh, it's, a, it's a good viable option that reduces the um, connectivity between a variety of different systems. You can do this cheaper by combining systems, but then what is the cost that you have in that regards? Things are gonna break in your application. Um, it's, it's the reality of development. We always, we know that nothing ships to production without a bug in it that we aren't aware of, or that we are aware of and just realize that it's not as severe a bug that we need to triage immediately. But if you aren't thinking about how you monitor your system, you're gonna be like this. You're gonna think that everything's fine, but things are going wrong all around you and there's no alerts that are going off to tell you. You're, you're ignorant and it's amazing. So when I'm looking for a monitoring platform, and I could spend like the rest of this talk just reeling off monitoring platforms, uh, there's a few top requirements that I will have from them. I wanna make sure that the monitoring platform is consistent regardless of what it's monitoring, whether it's my infrastructure, my databases, my uh, backend systems, my front ends. I want, I want it to be a consistent platform. I don't wanna have to have a myriad of different things that I connect up with because I want it to easily integrate into the entire stack. I want to be able to look at how something is flowing through the stack, whether it's a, re a request that's come in from a user interaction in the UI flowing all the way through down to a database call. I want to be able to trace that because if there's a uh, problem, I can find that information all the way down. Uh, I want to have a single view of the monitoring output. I want to have a single view of where my infrastructure might be having issues without having to go to one system and then, go, oh, how does that correlate to the number of requests that we've got? And then have to like jump across to another system and be like, well, over here, the, it's slightly different. Um, or, and then do, uh, do correlations across those. But I just want to be able to push that data out to somewhere else. I, I don't want to just living inside of my monitoring platform for all time. Because if I do that, then it's very difficult for me to uh, make more intelligent decisions and process that data over time and understand trends over time within that of our application. Uh, like I said, there's a myriad of, uh, of products out there that will do this, uh, hosted by, like, provided by cloud providers or provided by um, like dedicated monitoring platforms. Uh, so I, I thought you know, it's best to talk about the one that integrates easily, easiestly with the other service that I've talked about, and that's uh, Azure Application Insight, part of the Azure Monitoring Suite. Um, it, it can, it's the thing that actually monitors your infrastructure with inside of Azure anyway. So if you're deploying resources into Azure, you've already got that first level of monitoring of your infrastructure. You can then pump that data out into like an ELK stack if you um, prefer to analyze it through there rather than um, App Insights as a tool. Uh, and then you can uh, plug that in across uh, the rest of your stack. You use logging um, uh, tools like Serialog to, to um, output across to App Insights as well as to other um, logging platforms as well. But monitoring isn't just about the errors that you might have in your application. It's also about what is the application doing? Like what are people doing with your application? Because we, if we can use a monitoring tool that can show us what a user has done in the site, then combine that with errors that have happened in the site, and we can trace that user's interactions through the site through to that error, it gives us a really rich view of how to reproduce that error. We, we can get away from that. No, no repo on my machine, it must be fine. But if we can see what the user's done, we can realize steps that we might miss because we didn't realize that that's how a user is using our system. Uh, this is a screenshot from App Insights of uh, a uh, application that I'm building at the moment. It's from an e-com platform. Uh, I have it doing um, page views. So as a user navigates around the system, uh, we're tracking what they're, they're doing. We have a, a session ID associated with that user so I can trace the the steps the user has gone through with that. And where that becomes really interesting is that if I was uh, combining this with an interaction they might perform, maybe it's an add to cart operation. I can see, well, a user has added a particular product to a cart, what other products might they have looked at first to have got there? Now, are our recommendation systems working with our, um, in our um, application platform? Uh, you can do the same sort of stuff with um, uh, Google Analytics, uh, with the Adobe Analytics Suite, with Track.js, most uh, monitoring platforms can do that, 
Uh, but being able to get that full view, I think, is a really great way and, and something that people don't think about the, with a monitoring system. A monitoring system is finding bugs, but you can also use it for so much more. Um, Azure Monitor has, again, a lovely price point when we're talking about a, a cheapskate's guide to using the cloud. Uh, the first five gig of data that you're storing in um, App Insights is only uh, free, so it's a good price. And then it's, it's about two and a half dollars per gigabyte after that. But because you can export data out of your monitoring tool, maybe you're only, you're, you're only storing you know, five gig of data in there and then pushing it across to a, like a cold store because you know, five gig represents six months worth of data that's been captured by your application. Well, do we need to constantly have access to every six months or could we just do a rolling six months through our real-time monitoring platform and then we have a second monitoring tool where we can do more historical analytics. But when you start working with the cloud, it's not just how do we use the right resources to make sure that we're saving or that we're spending our money wisely, it's how do we make sure that we're doing that and that we're not uh, getting hidden costs and we're not blowing out costs that we didn't realize. I worked with a company that was doing a migration to the cloud uh, for their applications. They were treating it very much as someone else's com uh, computers. They took their design and the infrastructure they had in their uh, hosting environment and they just moved it up to the cloud. Uh, it was going through the, the pre-production and the testing phases and after a couple of months they were wondering why their bills were about $150,000 a month. They weren't even in production yet. They weren't getting production load, but they were still exceeding the uh, amount of money that they were hoping to spend in the cloud. The cloud was promised to, to them as saving them money and here they are spending about 10 times what they were spending on their hosting environment. So how do we do that? We want to be able to catch where we're spending a lot of money. And inside of Azure, we have a uh, cost management tool. Uh, this is a screenshot from one of my subscriptions, and it's probably a little bit difficult uh, for the people down the back to, to see, but down in the bottom uh, left-hand side, it's always hard when you're saying it. Left, left, which left? Uh, so down this port, uh, portion here, a large chunk of my spend is happening from one particular resource. Turns out that's Azure Front Door. It's spending $88.49 on Azure Front Door in September. And then over on the other side, I can see the resource group that that's associated with, this one here, the bulk of my spend. Uh, and it turns out that that's actually a, a demo application that I spun up for a talk. This talk I gave in, I think it was April, and this is my September bill. Whoops. Um, so I, I didn't realize that I was spending that money still. Uh, I have since deleted that resource because I don't need to keep paying for a, a demo application that I have there. With Azure Cost Management, uh, we can set alerts. So I now have set alerts because the prediction that I've got in my monthly spend for this month is that it could get up to $300. Uh, thankfully, I actually have an MSDN subscription, so I'm not actually paying um, the, uh, the amount of money that's on that bill. I have about $200 in my MSDN subscription each month. So, uh, but $300, I'd, I'd be out of pocket at that point. So with uh, Cost Management and um, billing alerts, I can say, well, I don't want to spend more than $200 on this subscription or on this resource group, and then set percentages of that bill, or sorry, percentages of that budget to be alerted at. So at 50% of, um, of utilization, I want to receive an email. Um, I can also set it up so that it can send me an SMS, I can call webhooks, and do a bunch of stuff like that. Um, if you want to learn more about cost management and how to do governance with the cloud, uh, one of my colleagues, Sonia, is giving a talk in room five in the next time slot, where she's going to go through this in much more detail than I've got in the remaining seven minutes of, uh, of this talk. But uh, needless to say, uh, I will hopefully not overspend on my Azure bill quite as frequently as I have in the past. Thankfully, cost management doesn't cost anything, because that would be kind of rude. Oh, you want to manage your costs? It's going to cost you. So wait, then do you, is that factored into your cost management or whatnot? Um, but the other interesting thing about cost management is if you're doing a multi-cloud solution, it can do uh, cost management analysis over uh, Google Cloud and uh, GCP. Uh, that does cost uh, money, um, and the amount of, uh, uh, or the frequency of uh, monitoring, I think it is, is uh, what you pay on, but you know, it's still a, a good option if you're doing a multi-cloud environment, because you can then get one view of your bill across all of the cloud compute resources that you're leveraging. But we are coming towards the end of the session uh, today. Uh, so just time to okay, look back at some of the stuff that I, I touched on, because when I talk about being cheap in the cloud, it's gonna mean a different thing to everyone. Like I said at the start, 
if you are a uh, small company or a freelancer or something like that, what che is cheap to you is very different to what is cheap to uh, a large enterprise or national company or something like that. But what it really comes down to is you need to do some upfront planning. Think about the style of application you're building and what are going to be the most optimal resources to do that. Can you build it as a static website that you can deploy into a static hosting environment rather than building it onto an application that is run in a server that's run by IS or uh, Apache and just at the end of the day, all it is doing is uh, string building uh, HTML files? Can you mix and match technologies to build your application? Can you have a series of, uh, of REST endpoints running in uh, like a, a, an app service in, uh, in Azure or a, a, like a traditional web REST API but it's then communicating through events to a bunch of background processing handled by serverless components. Can you use multiple different data stores to uh, optimize the way that your data is read and written into the backend system? Break down your solution as much as you can into little pieces because then you can optimize and scale and uh, reallocate resources based off of the, where the bottlenecks are and where the performance uh, opportunities are with inside of your application. If you have one web server that is serving out your entire application, you've only got one point of scale. If you've got a serverless infrastructure or you've got your application split across half a dozen web servers um, and each of them is responsible for a little piece of the puzzle, you can scale those independently of each other and you don't necessarily have this enormous cost blowout that you might have. Look to simplify the integrations you have with other systems that you, you will be useful for building out the projects and the um, products that you need to deliver. The more integrations you have, the more complex the management of those integrations are. As people leave your organization, you've got to rotate passwords or um, disconnect accounts. Does someone need to spend an, like, an entire day going through and deleting someone's access because uh, it's across 15 different systems? Or is that a, an acceptable trade-off because those systems are giving you better value for what you actually need? And, you know, the, um, and the, the scenarios that would make that expensive are fewer and far between than the costs that you might try and save elsewhere. But spend big on the things that are going to make the biggest impact. Don't just be cheap for the sake of being cheap because if, you, if you're cheap on your data store, excellent, I'm only spending like $10 a month to store data, but it actually is causing a lot of complexity in the way that our application is managed and the, and the, the, the code changes that we have to do in our application become more costly because of it. So spend where the right places are to spend money. Uh, I have created a markdown file with about 30 odd resources to follow up. So there's plenty of light reading um, to follow on from this talk, but it's blog posts, it's um, uh, other talks, it's documentation that all goes through uh, things that are useful for thinking about how to optimize for the cloud and design solutions that aren't going to cost a lot of money. Um, so the, uh, there's a QR code if you want that, that will just um, jump through to the link. Uh, the link is aco.ms slash cheap cloud uh, slash NDC Sydney. I'll also tweet out this uh, link um, after the session. Uh, but if you want to know more, please come and find me afterwards because uh, we are pretty much at the end of what we have time for today. I want to thank you for coming down and listening to me talk about my experience and things that I've learned along the way building applications for the cloud. Um, I'll be around for the rest of the, the conference if you want to have a chat. I'll be, uh, I'll be at the attendee party tomorrow hosting that, so uh, I hope to see, uh, see you there. And most importantly, I hope to see you at PubConf on Friday evening for a bit of light enter entertainment to end the conference. But again, thanks for coming down, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the event.